this lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Since 1858, the ANS has supported research and education in numismatics and the history of money. With a collection of over 800,000 objects, an extensive library, a dynamic publishing arm, and ever-improving online research resources, we have become one of the largest numismatic institutions in the world. If you wish to support the ANS and the work we do, you can join as a member and become a part of this historic community. Go to numismatics.org membership to see options and prices. So uh, let's get kicked off here. Um, so uh, Newman Portal, NewmanPortal.org. Uh, we got uh, we went live uh, at the beginning of 2016, so we're about four years in here. And uh, just to review how we got started here, uh, charter uh, from Eric Newman uh, and the Eric P. Newman Numismatic Education Society, uh, which I'll refer to as UPNIS, um, with the objective and charter of just making uh, the numismatic literature and images uh, available to everyone on a free and forever basis. Um, we've had just a real revolution and continuing revolution in uh, the digital side of numismatics and uh, we're playing our part in that. Okay, so what have we put together in the last four years? Um, we have uh, an online uh, availability of a great variety of auction catalogs, um, about 10,000 total, um, starting in the mid 19th century. Um, actually, uh, we did the early Sotheby's catalogs. They actually start in the 1700s. Um, so going back even, even that far. Um, periodicals. Um, from a lot of different organizations and some commercial ones as well, up to 15,000. Uh, multimedia, uh, video and audio files, about 3,000. And then uh, a lot of archival items from National Archives, from ANS, uh, from the Eric P. Newman papers, and then about 1,000 reference books as well. So, uh, why not Google? Um, I know a lot of us, uh, whenever we have a question, numismatic or otherwise, we go to Google. So, and it's really good for what it is. Um, we're doing things Google doesn't. Uh, so when Google started the Google Books project, uh, they backed up their trucks to the major university libraries, Harvard, Stanford, University of Michigan, and they just scanned the whole thing. And they've got about 25 million books online. Um, but uh, it turns out, that all those major university libraries don't have a lot of specialized numismatic resources. Um, you want a full set of Chapman catalogs. Uh, you won't find them in the university libraries. They, they're all in collector hands. Uh, you want the plated and priced ones. They're all in collector's hands or uh, specialized libraries such as ANS. So uh, we're filling uh, a niche area that uh, you won't find covered by the larger uh, aggregators like uh, Hottie Trust and Internet Archive and Google Books. Okay, so uh, clearly there's a, a revolution going on in digital numismatics. It's uh, greatly impacted the, the market side of things and uh, starting to more and more impact the academic side of things as well. So uh, again, we're uh, playing our part in, in that revolution and uh, hopefully doing it in a good way. Okay, so uh, to give some idea of our overall structure, uh, you know, in life you always follow the money. So uh, that's what we do here. Uh, the, the funding is coming from uh, the Eric P. Newman Numismatic Education Society. Uh, Eric uh, started this foundation in 1958 and uh, it, it's funded a, a number of uh, numismatic initiatives. Uh, including the ANS uh, Graduate Seminar, uh, ANA Summer Seminar. Uh, of course, while, while Eric was living, it uh, you know, underwrote uh, all of his publications. And uh, uh, more recently, we've started making uh, direct grants, research grants to authors, and uh, also sponsoring uh, some other content for uh, Newman Portal, which we'll get into later. So um, the money from EPNIS flows to uh, Washington University. Uh, the Newman family has had a longstanding relationship with WashU. Eric uh, graduated from law school there in 1935. 
Uh, his son, Andy, is currently the chairman of the board of trustees at WashU. And uh, so they've uh, worked with WashU on any number of uh, programs, uh, one of which is a Newman portal. Within the university, and uh, I should state that I'm a, I am a university employee, uh, I work within Olin Library, and then uh, NNP is a project uh, administered uh, by the library. So uh, from there, uh, NNP, we have a couple employees at, at WashU, which I'm one, and then we work with a number of uh, outside vendors to uh, put this all together. So uh, Internet Archive is used as our main document repository. Uh, Notch 8 is uh, developing our software for the website. Um, and then we have some other contractors uh, who do uh, photography and scanning work for us. Okay, so another overall view um, is from the IT perspective. Where is the information coming from? And uh, starting on the left here, we do uh, scanning work uh, at WashU, where uh, the remnants of the Newman Library are still at WashU. Uh, there was a sale of uh, some of the more uh, valuable items in the Newman Library uh, that Heritage conducted in November of 2018, uh, but we've still got thousands of things at, at WashU uh, to, to work through. We've done, uh, have, we've had a full-time scanner at ANS for I think three or four years now. Uh, so we've gone through a lot of uh, content there uh, from the rare book room to archival items uh, to uh, auction catalogs and, uh, and other things. And I, additionally, ANS has shared with us many electronic resources of uh, stuff that had already been scanned uh, through other efforts. Uh, National Archives, uh, we do a lot of work at. Uh, we've had several people go into National Archives locations in College Park, Maryland, Philadelphia, Denver, and uh, scan that material for us. And then a lot of material just comes in electronically. So anyone that's creating new information now, it's all born digital. Uh, they might print out some, but for the most part, uh, it, it's all digital and uh, we get it that way and that way we don't have to scan it and it can be ingested directly in the new one portal. Our scanning all goes into Internet Archive. They're the repository for all the documents and uh, they feed uh, Newman Portal directly, and then they also feed the uh, Donum, which is the library catalog at ANS. So if you go into the library catalog at ANS and uh, you pull up a, a catalog entry for a document that we have scanned, uh, that catalog entry will link directly to the scan on Internet Archive. Um, so, uh, and, uh, and David Hill helped a lot in making that happen. And uh, there was just uh, some spreadsheet machinations and some other scripts that had to happen, but we were able to link all that material together. So uh, today in the ANS library catalog, there are about 7,000 entries uh, that will take you directly to the scan copy. So in addition to um, all the documents we scan, uh, we also have some internal databases uh, that, that we maintain on newmanportal.org directly. Uh, there's an image database. Uh, there's a uh, numismatic biographies that was seeded by uh, Pete Smith. Uh, we have uh, a dictionary that uh, comes from multiple sources, including uh, Dick Johnson's Encyclopedia of Coin and Metal Technology. And then we've got uh, Auction Prices Realized, uh, which is a service that we contract uh, through uh, CDN uh, to provide that information on uh, NNP. Okay, so let's uh, look at some of the collection growth over the last uh, three or four years. You can see uh, documents up, uh, rising from 10 to 40,000 within that time. Page count now over 3 million. Uh, the image database did not exist at the beginning, that was added later. And then uh, a lot of uh, multimedia items and uh, what, what's really been encouraging is to see the widespread uh, uh, response from the community in terms of 
uh, people contributing information. So we're now up to over 100 organizations and individuals that have made uh, contributions to Newman Portal. And that's what we're really trying to do is just enable a community-based platform for uh, sharing information and just making it as widely uh, available as possible. Okay, as I mentioned uh, earlier, a lot of the information is now coming in electronically. Uh, so this is an older chart, but it'll convey the idea. Um, we have a uh, scanning that we do it uh, in St. Louis at, at WashU. And then there's a lot of scanning at ANS as well. So that's a major part of the collection. And uh, more recently, really the largest uh, contributions to the collection are coming in electronically. So uh, since uh, the COVID epidemic started, of course, it's all electronic because we can't scan it all right now. Um, but people are, are at home, they're bored, and they want to contribute. So that's great. Um, we've been uh, taking in uh, a lot of electronic contributions uh, in the last couple of months. So uh, there's no shortage of work, even though our scanning machines are uh, technically down right now. <laughs> Okay, so who's out there contributing? Uh, just tons of people. Uh, there's a whole alphabet soup of uh, different specialty clubs. Uh, if your favorite one isn't listed there, they probably are a contributor, but there wouldn't be enough space on the slide. Uh, so we have uh, specialty clubs, we have our regional uh, numismatic organizations, and then we have individual contributors as well. Um, and then also we get the uh, commercial companies have contributed. So uh, uh, Stax Bowers uh, through uh, 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 actually the older Stax Bowers content is owned by PCGS. Um, there was, uh, you could make a complicated chart of how all these companies evolved over time, but suffice it to say, uh, PCGS owns all the pre-2004 Bowers and Marina content, but they uh, graciously allowed us to present all of those auction catalogs on NNP. So in addition to the, uh, all the Bowers uh, house organs and periodicals uh, are, are, are available as well. Uh, Don Kagan opened up their 300 auction sales catalogs. Um, and uh, all, all the major uh, auction houses have, have allowed us to present their material on NNP. So that uh, just having all that stuff searchable in one place is just a, a resource that uh, did not exist um, prior to this. Uh, all the CDN archives are on there as well. And then uh, we've worked with a number of institutions um, of which uh, ANS is one of the largest contributors and ANS has uh, just been wonderful about uh, open scholarship and uh, sharing content with everyone. Um, and, and this is sort of a, a trend within the academic world. Uh, academic world tends to be more uh, open with publications. Um, and uh, so ANS has, has opened up almost everything uh, with the exception of uh, ANS Magazine. Uh, which is a, a member benefit, and it's important to preserve that. So uh, we do have the older issues on NNP, but uh, the more recent issues, I think the last uh, five years or so, um, are reserved for members. Um, since the, the ANS magazine, of course, is very well done, and uh, that's an important member benefit. Uh, the ANA opened up the numismatist through uh, 2002, I believe. Uh, so all of those are on NNP. Um, and then uh, National Archives, we've done a ton of work at, and um, I, I get <clears throat> a little bit more excited about National Archives because um, a lot of this information has just uh, never been used or seen by a lot of people. Um, and that's sort of, it's, it's a good source of really fresh information uh, for numismatic research. So uh, Roger Burdett and others are uh, working heavily with that material. And uh, for a lot of Roger's publications uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, National Archives has really been uh, one of the most important resources uh, for those publications. Um, and this material is really hard to get to because uh, you have to take off work, you have to travel, you have to show up during uh, normal business hours. 
Um, and then it's tedious to just look through everything. Um, so what we've done, and we now have uh, over a quarter million pages of uh, National Archives material on Newman Portal, is at least make it so you can look at this at home. Um, and it still takes time. It's still not a trivial thing to do, um, but it's a lot easier than it used to be. Um, so we're working with um, a number of the uh, entries within the U.S. Mint Record Group. Uh, the General Correspondence Group uh, is about uh, 200 volumes that are like 500 pages each. Uh, and we're almost at the end of that series. And then there's uh, many, many other things to do as well. Um, but uh, that's one thing I'm, I'm really glad that uh, we've been able to make that material available online. Um, Washington University is a federal deposit library, which means that uh, it gets a great deal of government publications uh, in the library. It's one, one of the big collections within the library. And it turns out the, uh, that there's a ton of numismatic information in the government publication series. So anything legislative uh, related to coins or metals or currency issues uh, will be covered in the congressional proceedings. Uh, so we've got a lot of those. And then uh, even you get some oddball publications like the Denver Mint put out a, a pamphlet on, you know, this is how you make a penny um, like 40 years ago. Um, so we, we have stuff like that on there as well. Um, the St. Louis Federal Reserve Library uh, has done a lot of work in this area as well. Um, scanning <coughs> things like uh, treasury reports um, and uh, publications of the, the Secretary of the Treasury. So there's some good numismatic information in these as well. And with the Fraser material, that's all electronic to begin with. And they've freely shared that with us. And uh, we can uh, copy it all over to Newman Portal and uh, index it and, and make it searchable along with all, all the other uh, numismatic information. Uh, museum of American Finance uh, is a small uh, museum in New York. Uh, they had, uh, they've had a publication for, uh, I think, about 30 or 40 years, uh, which uh, they have graciously allowed us to uh, present on NNP as well. Okay, so let's uh, talk more specifically about ANS. Um, so we've had a full-time scanner at ANS uh, for three or four years. Uh, they've got a, a dedicated room, which is great. Um, very safe with respect to COVID when they reopen. Um, and uh, uh, the NNP sponsors that individual. So some of the things we've done, uh, the brand ledgers. So Virgil Brand was an uh, important collector in the Chicago area. Uh, had a collection of over 100,000 pieces, arguably the greatest American collection of all time. Um, there was never a big auction sale, so uh, he's not famous in that way. Um, but the ANS has the brand ledgers that represent his uh, collection inventory. Um, and uh, I think, uh, I believe it was Andrew Reinhardt that had to personally drive him down to the Internet Archive Center in Princeton to get these things scanned. They, they were too big uh, to do on site uh, because of the machine that we have there. Um, but uh, we got them done and uh, researchers like uh, Saul Teichman uh, have been indexing a lot of the content in those ledgers to make it uh, more uh, easily accessible. Um, New Netherlands archives, uh, auction firm, 1950s and 60s, uh, John Ford and Charles Wormser. Uh, we have um, a lot of their uh, bid books and uh, auction catalog drafts. Um, and uh, that, that's all been scanned now. The Garrett Family papers are there. Uh, it's an important U.S. multi-generational collection uh, sold in the early 80s by Bowers and Ruddy. Uh, a fair amount of correspondence related to the formation of the collection and then collection inventories as well. 
Uh, we've also scanned uh, a lot of auction sale catalogs at ANS. They have a series of bound uh, US early auction sales, about 600 volumes, uh, each with uh, multiple uh, auction catalogs in it. And uh, those, those are all online too. Um, and uh, as I noted before, we have been able to link the ANS library catalog uh, to uh, Internet Archive uh, so that uh, any uh, catalog records you pull up, uh, or, or at least a large number of catalog records that you pull up, uh, will be linked directly to the scans. Okay, so this is what the uh, virtual brand leg ledgers look like. Uh, 32 oversized volumes. They're very impressive in person. Um, and uh, filling out these ledgers was a full-time job for somebody. I, I don't know who, if uh, Brand did it himself or uh, hired somebody to do it, um, but uh, he would go to an auction or bid by mail and the stuff would arrive and be entered into uh, the, uh, the ledgers. All right, uh, this is an example page from uh, the Garrett family archives, uh, including uh, correspondence related to the formation of the collection, uh, inventory of the collection. Uh, this is a page that uh, just lists their uh, 1792 US pattern coins and uh, 20 boxes of material. Um, and th this has all been scanned and now online. All right, and then what we're doing currently is we're working through the uh, Samuel Hudson and Henry Chapman correspondence. Uh, we've gotten through the letter R, which is 1800 correspondence and uh, probably another five or 700 to go. Um, unfortunately, this effort was cut short by the epidemic, but we hope to get that uh, up and running again when ANS reopens. Uh, this particular letter, uh, circa 1900, this is from uh, LT Broadstone, uh, who uh, operated a uh, collector's periodical out of Nebraska, including a numismatic section, uh, little, known, little known today. And uh, this is uh, uh, Broadstone uh, soliciting the Chapmans for advertising in uh, Philatelic West. So uh, this is several thousand pieces of correspondence. Um, the ANS acquired this uh, probably 15 or 20 years ago. I remember working with uh, Frank Campbell um, on, on some of this to, to get access to some of it when it, when it came in. Um, and uh, it's a tre tremendously valuable resource for, for researchers and uh, will we'll all be available online within a few months. Okay. Uh, National Archives, uh, one of our uh, important uh, archival repositories, has a lot of material from the U.S. Mint, uh, from the U.S. Treasury. Um, Bob Julian had uh, previously done a lot of work in Philadelphia uh, via sponsorship from Central States Numismatic Society. He shared all of that with us. And then uh, we've uh, employed contractors as well to go into National Archives and, and scan things. Um, so the, the most active effort is in Philadelphia and College Park. We're actually finished in Denver. Uh, John Grafeo was uh, previously in, in the ANS library uh, doing scanning work for us and then he moved out to Denver and we were able to employ him to scan all of the newest manic material at Denver National Archives, most of it related to Denver Mint. Um, so that effort is completed and we're uh, operating now in uh, College Park and, and Philadelphia. So uh, Roger Burdett is uh, collecting a lot of scans anyway for his personal use. So uh, he shares them uh, with us. And then uh, in Philadelphia, we're working through the archives more systematically uh, through the General Correspondence uh, Record Group. And uh, Nicole Fry, who previously worked for us in St. Louis um, is doing that work. Okay, so um, in addition to all the contributed uh, material, we also um, sponsor some other content uh, via EPNIS directly. Uh, the Coin Television Archives, um, David Lazo has been attending uh, numismatic shows and conventions since the 1980s. 
and videotaping presentations. And we have uh, over uh, 2,000 videos uh, documenting that period. Uh, so these are uh, a record that you can't get any other way. Um, you might hear about some of these people who are no longer with us and you can read what they wrote and listen to people talk about them. Um, but to actually uh, see them in person is, is a little bit more uh, a visceral, a little bit more revealing. Uh, so you can see videotape of uh, Walter Breen and John Ford and, and Eric Newman and uh, be able to uh, get a little bit more insight into their character. All right, uh, the Newman papers, um, some of these uh, were, were sold in November 2018, 2018, but we still have uh, a large amount remaining in, in St. Louis, uh, about 40 boxes at last count. So <clears throat> we're going through these carefully and uh, just organizing material and uh, cataloging it and scanning it. And that just happens a, a box at a time um, and we're continuing to, to work through it. Uh, fortunately, I had bought a few boxes home to work on uh, just before the, the epidemic hit us. So I've been able to uh, catalog everything here uh, while, while we've been locked up. So uh, those will get forwarded to the scanner as soon as we're back up and running. The uh, early paper Money, uh, published by uh, Eric P. Newman in multiple editions from 1967 to 2008. Uh, was the fifth edition. We now have the live NNP edition. Uh, the material from the fifth edition has been uh, copied online and we occasionally get uh, corrections and edits and uh, contributions from people who are researching in this field. Uh, David Gladfelter is very active in the area of New Jersey paper money. Uh, so we've been uh, able to incorporate some of his updates into the uh, NNP edition. And then, oops, within uh, the last year, we started a new program in 2019, uh, the Newman Grants Program. This is uh, direct assistance to individual researchers. Um, and they apply and we announce the, the awards on, on May 25th each year, which is uh, Eric P. Newman's birthday. Um, so we've got uh, another good crop this year. Um, Chris McDowell will be working on uh, FugioSense. Uh, we've got a professor at uh, Georgia State University, uh, Harcourt Fuller, working on uh, black numismatics. And uh, all of these uh, authors and researchers, uh, as part of the grant, uh, allow NNP to uh, present this material online. So it's another way of uh, acquiring content for Newman Portal. All right. Um, one other thing we're doing in the background is web archiving. So uh, about 20 years ago, Internet Archive started this thing called the Wayback Machine. Uh, the idea was to record every page on the Internet. Of course, that's an impossible task, um, but you can get a lot of it. And they've got terabytes and petabytes and uh, all this stuff all up in the cloud. Um, a lot of this is used for opposition political research. So politician says something, does something, you can look up 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, no, that doesn't quite line up with uh, what you said before. Um, a, a lot of people are using Wayback Machine for uh, that kind of research. Um, what we use it for is we've uh, identified a number of important numismatic websites, um, websites, they tend to be ephemeral, they come and go. And if you don't save them, it's all lost. So uh, we have a, a, a quarterly crawl that goes over uh, about 500 numismatic websites. Um, uh, Wayne Omrin has uh, carefully curated a list of those sites. Um, so uh, we're not just throwing the large sites in there, we're you know, trying to be selective about this and, and picking good content. Uh, so we crawl those quarterly, and uh, those are all in the Wayback Machine today. Uh, they can be accessed there. Um, they're not indexed on NNP. Uh, that's more of a long-term project. 
uh, but uh, this is a resource we'll, we'll be tapping at some point. So when you do NNP searches, uh, you might get web pages uh, in addition to uh, the other search results. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, in copyright, out of copyright. Um, most of the material on NNP is full view. Uh, some, of, some of the in copyright material is not full view. Um, it is searchable and uh, you get a snippet and you see the same thing on Google Books. Um, they can't give you full view on everything. Um, but hopefully they give you enough context so you can tell if this is a, a resource that I need to go hunt down and, and look at more carefully. So about 20% of our collection is in copyright, um, primarily uh, Coin World, which we've scanned uh, all 3,000 issues, a numismatic scrapbook, uh, more current issues of the numismatist, and uh, we do prefer to get full view material, so I will scan those first. But if it's something important, uh, Coin World is really sort of, uh, in many ways, the, the standard record uh, for, for the period. And so it's just important to preserve that. Um, and uh, Beth Deicher was uh, very instrumental in making that happen, supported the project, and that was just something we wanted to get done, and so we did. Um, we're currently working on numismatic news as well. Um, so there are just some in copyright things that, that, that need to be pre preserved and uh, that, that's part of our mission. Uh, so there was a very long running legal battle uh, that came out of the Google Books project, uh, Authors Guild versus Google, and went all the way up to the Supreme Court and eventually uh, the basic idea is that, yes, you can scan in copyright materials uh, for search purposes, uh, not for full view. Uh, so that's settled law at this point, and, uh, you know, we uh, operate accordingly. All right, so let's talk about what's coming up in the ANS scanning queue. Uh, we do have, uh, you know, a couple months more on the Chapman material once things reopen, um, but there's some other things in the queue as well, and uh, there, there's uh, no shortage of these things. Um, so still just tons of work out there that can be done. Um, the Numismatic Notes and Monographs series, uh, they were done by Google Books at the beginning of that project. And they're just low quality uh, black and white scans. The plates are generally unusable. Um, so this is a series I'd like to redo. Um, it, it deserves it. Uh, the publications of International uh, Numismatic Congress have been open to us. Uh, Uda uh, Wartenberg Kagan was instrumental in making that happen. So we've got those in the queue. They've been having uh, conference proceedings every six years for like the last hundred years. Uh, someone asked for the uh, uh, Hess auction sale catalogs, a uh, European firm. So uh, we've added those to the queue. And then uh, within uh, US Numismatics, there's still a lot of things uh, we'd like to get. Uh, there's some uh, archives from the Norweb collection. There's a Joseph Nickley diary, ninth, uh, important uh, Philadelphia 19th century collector. Uh, the Barber papers, are there as well. They may be in photocopy form, but I know they're accessible there. So uh, we'd like to get those. Um, and then, uh, you know, people just send in one-off requests. Um, uh, Pete Smith asked us to do the, the Bushnell manuscript on early American coinage. So, uh, so this is all in the queue and uh, we'll get the Chapman project uh, wrapped up and uh, get on to these other things. Okay, so for the project, um, what do we see happening in the next few months? Um, the big thing right now is numismatic news. Um, it's on two pallets in St. Louis. Uh, we got through about 2% of it before the, the epidemic got us. So uh, that, that'll be the primary activity once we resume. And uh, uh, George Kuhay and uh, 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 the other guy, sorry, his name slips my mind. We're very from Krause, uh, Cliff Mischler. We're uh, very 
instrumental in uh, getting that to us and uh, George Kue in particular uh, supervised all the bundling of the material on the Iola Wisconsin side and uh, got that to us in St. Louis. So that will keep us very busy for a while once we get back up and running. The Newman papers, uh, we've been doing those little by little and that'll continue. There's still a lot of work to be done there. And then continued uh, individual contributions will come in. Um, these are generally not dependent on scanning. Uh, we got uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we got a really interesting collection of Irish political tokens. Uh, this uh, gentleman, uh, Bruce Mosher, has uh, been collecting counterstaffed Irish coins uh, related to the Irish Troubles uh, beginning in 1969 and uh, extending into the 1990s. Um, and it, it's a really fascinating collection and it's not a valuable collection, but it's historically uh, important um, and just reflects the various political sentiments that were being counter stamped onto coins, both on uh, you know, the nationalist and, and the royalist side. So we've got all the images of that, of that collection are online, uh, along with a descriptive catalog that, that Mosher put together. Um, so, you know, something like that, you're, you're never going to have a PCGS registry set for Irish political tokens because they're all unique. Um, so, but I thought this was a really neat collection um, and, and conveyed a lot of uh, political history and, and sentiment of what's going on in England and Ireland at that time. So, uh, we got that uh, documented. I was glad to add that. Um, the next thing is uh, we are currently uh, rebuilding our back end. Um, the platform that we're running on now is uh, proprietary and we're going to be moving to something called Samvera, which is a open source solution for uh, libraries, archives, museums, uh, galleries uh, to uh, catalog uh, various uh, different kinds of, of media. Um, it, it's, 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 it's more of a, a library solution. I, I, I don't see it uh, being any substitute for uh, the ANS online databases, which are uh, very specifically built for numismatics, which is uh, the right way to do it. Uh, Samvera is a more general solution, very good for libraries. Um, so, uh, we're, we're in the process of uh, migrating the site to that. Uh, the advantage of being on an open source uh, platform is that uh, you have uh, hundreds of uh, libraries and archives that are using the solution already. There's a lot of different people doing development on it. So as they add features, we can essentially pick them up for free. Uh, if someone comes up with a new cool document viewer that does a lot of stuff that ours doesn't, uh, we, we can easily incorporate that. Um, so, and Sam Vera is also being used for other projects at the Washington University Library. So there's some synergy there um, in terms of having, uh, having developers that, that can be fluent on uh, multiple uh, instantiations of, of, of this project within WashU rather than just having a, a one-off staff that's uh, fully dedicated to a single project and, and not portable to the others. And then uh, of course the other thing is the reopening. Um, right now the plan is and it's not definite but we're thinking that WashU staff will open up again on August 1st. Um, so if that happens, then we'll be able to start scanning at St. Louis, so that'd be great. Um, National Archives uh, has not announced any plans for reopening. Um, and I, I haven't seen uh, anything from ANS either, but um, I, I'm sure that's, that, that's being uh, considered as uh, all, all organizations are looking at that right now. All right, and then uh, finally, um, in light of the epidemic, uh, we came up with this idea to have an online symposium. So this is happening uh, August 28th and 29th uh, via Zoom. Um, you can uh, register at nnpsymposium.org. 
Uh, we have some good speakers lined up already. Uh, Greg Rowan from Heritage will be talking about uh, the impacts of uh, COVID on the numismatic business. Uh, we've got uh, John Dan Reuther will be talking about uh, 1841 quarter eagles. Um, and uh, we've got uh, a number of good, good speakers lined up and uh, uh, David Fanning will be on there and uh, a lot of other names. Um, but the, uh, the website and a peace symposium, uh, there's a speaker list there and you can see the different programs that will be offered. Uh, of course, this is all free service to the numismatic community. And uh, we're, we're planning to do these um, on a continuing basis. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll just open up a lot of good numismatic content to, to people that uh, can't travel or e even with active shows might not travel just because, uh, you know, it's logistically uh, difficult to do. Um, so we're hoping that we can uh, just expand the reach of uh, numismatics through this program. So uh, this will be happening at the end of August. Um, we've already gotten some indication that uh, some of the people who were uh, canceled uh, at the ANA convention will, will be using this forum to host uh, club meetings or presentations. Uh, so, so this will be an option for that. All right, so I'm going to go over to the chat now if I can figure that out and go over to those questions. A lot, a lot of comments here. Okay. All right, uh, I'll just read these. Uh, digital humanities has become a catchword for efforts to use computer technology to study humanities in new ways uh, beyond providing databases, the portal involved in this effort. Yeah, I, I would say that, um, you know, our move to uh, Sam Vera is definitely within this di digital humanities space. Um, it, you know, it's getting on to a solution that <clears throat> a lot of these other efforts um, <laughs> other digitization efforts are involved with. Um, so uh, that, that's probably our, our strongest response to that. Um, next one is international banknotes. I think they're asking about International Banknote Society on there. Uh, yes, they are. Um, we have the IBNS journals. Um, uh, question for later, how can people contribute content? Uh, they contribute scans or hard copies. Um, for digital content, you can email it to me directly. Um, uh, Leonard.augsberger at uh, wustl, W-U-S-T-L uh, dot org. Um, or the, the other address is, uh, if you look at the, the front page of newmanportal.com, uh, or sorry, front page of newmanportal.org, uh, there's a contact uh, NNP and you can go through that link as well. Uh, do you can collaborate with any non-US institutions? Um, yeah, there's been, uh, we, we've connected with um, some things in, in UK, um, some, uh, I know there's one numismatic organization, I can't remember their name, uh, that uh, shared some material with us. Um, again, most of it's digital. so. Uh, we're, we're happy to, 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 to talk, talk with anyone. Uh, we picked up uh, 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 Richard Lussier just recently put together a uh, 11 volume set on Austrian orders and medals. Um, it's uh, thousands of pages. Uh, it's, it's something that really wouldn't be viable in printed form, um, but electronically it works great. So uh, that, that's a resource that, that was recently added. All right, uh, what percentage of US and world numismatics do you feel are on NNP? Uh, how many unique users use the portal annually? Um, probably, we're probably about 80, 20 in terms of US. And uh, we deliberately started with an American focus um, just because we thought taking on everything would just be way too much. Um, but as we go, uh, we are adding um, ancient and world content. Um, and then also you just pick up a lot of that stuff automatically. So we've scanned uh, every Stags catalog since 1935, over a thousand pieces. 
and there's a ton of uh, ancient and, and world content there. Uh, we picked up this week uh, the uh, Davison's uh, auction house in Minnesota. Uh, so that's uh, primarily ancient and world. Um, and uh, once we reopen, uh, they're going to send us the ones that we don't have, uh, which is a lot of the early ones. Um, so uh, Sotheby's, we've got all of the out of copyright material from 1795 to 1924, uh, a lot of ancient and world. And uh, the other thing I find with Sotheby's is you once in a while just get these oddball uh, American things in there. I was working with uh, a, an award medal uh, the other day, 19th century award medal from New England Society for uh, promotion of uh, manufacturers and mechanic arts. And an example shows up in uh, Sotheby's catalog in uh, you know, 1850 or whatever. It's, uh, so there, there's uh, good, good US stuff in those too. All right. Uh, when you scan documents, do you produce word searchable electronic versions where possible? Uh, having used the portal for research, uh, kudos to people who made it possible. It's a fantastic resource. Okay. Uh, thank you for the nice words. Um, yes, we do produce um, a text file. Uh, when we, we scan, it goes on the Internet Archive, and then Internet Archive creates what are called these uh, derived files. And uh, that includes the, the text file creates a PDF. And uh, so yes, th those are available. Uh, if you can't find them, you can uh, just email me. I can direct you accordingly. Uh, follow up to a question from uh, Jay. Uh, what is this process? Scan OCR QA post. Uh, do you need help crowdsourcing the QA? So this process uh, in the digitization world is called uh, republishing. And uh, that's just a fancy word for uh, taking the raw scans and uh, getting them into a state where they can be presented uh, to users. So <clears throat> we scan it. Um, and a lot of this is kind of like magic almost because, uh, for example, we have uh, Tabletop Scribe at Internet Archive and uh, we, we scan the document there. And then some hours later, or days, depending on their backup, um, it just magically appears to us with all the text files and the PDF files. Um, so that process that is actually all contracted out to Internet Archive, and we pay them a per page rate for, for providing that service. Um, so yeah, there, there's no uh, capability to, to, to crowdsource the, the QA right now, because that's all outsourced. Uh, okay. Uh, I was pleased to see my name, though misspelled, on a chart about the brand ledgers, which I've been studying for years. Uh, I assume this is from Mr. Bonaguro. Uh, so I apologize for not getting the name right. Not sure what happened there. Um, are you working with anyone from the Fitzwilliam Library? Oh, that's uh, an interesting question. Um, the uh, gentleman who recently passed away uh, was working over there, um, Ted Buttry. Um, I did exchange some email with him early on. Um, the organization wasn't quite at the level we needed it to be at. Um, his description of things over there um, wasn't didn't sound like something we could just step into immediately and just start scanning. Um, it is something we're open to. Um, and uh, I've also checked along that that front, I've checked with Internet Archive to see if they have personnel available in London that we could uh, contract this out to. Um, but yeah, it, it's uh, it, it's something I'm, I'm definitely open to, and if if anyone has a good contact over there, um, you know, feel free to send that to me. Um, but uh, yeah, I know they have uh, a, a ton of good stuff over there that isn't necessarily duplicated at ANS. All right, um, any chance of getting uh, Jock Schulman sales and Adolf Weil material scanned? Um, yes. <laughs> um, I know we have a lot of the Hans Schulman already. Um, 
and the Jacques Schulman, I believe, is a generation older than that. Um, and uh, yes, it, absolutely, that's available at ANS, and uh, we'd like to do it. It's uh, just just a question of where it goes into the queue. Uh, any collaboration with Library of Congress? Uh, they have uh, limited but interesting stuff. Um, yeah, I think um, you know you know what works best uh, in terms of building the collection is um, if we have. A, a long list of identified resources before we go in. So, you know, we go into ANS, we know they have a whole run of Chapman catalogs that we need to do. So that's easy. Um, at the Library of Congress, um, at least in my experience using them, is you find a lot of uh, one-off things. So like, yes, it's there, but, you know, just to find one thing, um, uh, it takes a lot of investigation. So you might, you know, for example, go through the Jefferson letters and, you know, find a couple things on, on numismatics. Um, so yeah, I, 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 we haven't talked with anyone at, at Library of Congress, uh, but I know it's, uh, there's a lot of needles in, in the haystack there. Maybe that's, that's the best way of uh, describing it. Uh, is there a good search term for the Garrett archives? Um, for example, Chapman outgoing correspondence is best gotten with letterpress. Um, Yes. Um, there are ways of doing this. Um, uh, best to uh, mail me directly and I, I can provide advice. Uh, we do have uh, something on NNP called uh, Power Search, uh, which is a little bit better for uh, something like this. And I, I can give specifics um, offline. Um, but there are um, some other ways of looking at the collection that aren't always obvious. So um, that's definitely something I can help with. Um, can you scan documents and mint records from the Smithsonian archives? Ah, that's, uh, that's a good thought. Um, We probably could, and uh, you know, I, I was there a couple years ago. The uh, McLean Stefanelli papers had all been opened, and uh, some really great stuff in there. Uh, you know, I remember seeing uh, the original uh, paste-up draft copy of uh, Edgar Adams' book on uh, territorial gold is there, so that was a neat item. Um, and then, there, you know, of course, there's tons of stuff in in the McLean Stefanelli uh, uh, correspondence as well. Um, yeah, that, that's an interesting. Yeah, um, I'll give it, give, give that some thought. Um, we have, uh, 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 a researcher that's going down or a, a scanner right now that's going uh, to Philadelphia for us, but uh, maybe she could spend a few days in Washington as well. Um, if you have specific targets you're interested in, let me know. Um, I, that might be something we could do. Uh, please give your email address. Uh, yes. Uh, Leonard, L-E-O-N-A-R-D uh, dot Augsburger, A-U-G-S-B-U-R-G-E-R. Uh, my name's on the, the Zoom screen there, uh, in case you need the spelling. Uh, and then at uh, Wustel, which is W-U-S-T-L, so Washington, St. Louis, uh, dot E-D-U. So hopefully that got through. Uh, if not, just go to the front page of uh, newmanportal.org, and uh, there's you, you can also contact me that way. All right, any other questions out there? Yeah, I unmuted everyone, so if you guys okay. you know, have anything to say, you sure. can just get now. Can I make a comment? This is Uta. Hang on. Yes. I'm not the video, actually. Um, I just wanted to say about the Fitzwilliam and the ANS. Um, my impression is that I would say 95% what is uh, in, in the Fitzwilliam is also in the ANS. And in fact, the ANS has a lot of stuff that isn't in the Fitzwilliam. Mm. Okay. I would think there's really no need to. Okay. Um, what is so amazing is that by Ted created this amazing, um, you know, sort of listing, which we all use in order to know what auction catalogs exist. And 
it's heavily focused on ancients and that's obviously something mm -hmm. that we always want to have more of whereas obviously um you know he's still focusing more on on the american side which i uh, understand but um but i think the the um it is really amazing how this has changed the field i mean you you sort of almost underselling yourself there is i think it's really amazing and i wanted to really express um you know my own personal but also really on everyone's behalf for for this unbelievable thing that you and um you know the newman family and i know eric started it um initially which was i think particularly interesting you know when you always think that how old he was i remember when he first didn't even want to use an email and once he got it you could never get him off it um so i i really want to express uh um, my thanks also on behalf of you know everyone that uses it but also in particular ANS. Yeah thanks Uta. Um, yeah well let's let's all thank Eric Newman for paying for this and uh, yeah uh, even though he uh, was not a rapid adopter of technology um, he had a sense of the importance of it so that, that was the key thing. Not yeah he, he was uh, he was active on email but uh, he did not use uh, the internet a lot for research um, so that, that was uh, he needed to live a few more years for that, but uh, so. But uh, the, the key thing is he he understood the importance of it. Um, I have a very quick question here. Uh, whenever I do a, any research numismatic related, and I go to Google and I put you know search terms or whatever, I'm gonna say if not. 90, 95% of the time, I don't see the uh, numismatic portal coming up. And I'm not quite sure why not. I mean, I usually would go afterwards to, if I can't find it on Google, I'll go to the numismatic portal. But I would have thought it should come up uh, in my search on Google, and it doesn't. And I'm not quite sure why. Yeah, uh, Google is definitely indexing us. I, I know that. Um, I, I just see tons of our stuff on there. But uh, why it is more likely to do one resource than another, I, I'm not really sure. Um, but I... Now, m my understanding is most sites, uh, e-commerce sites mostly, they would use uh, some keyword and they would pay Google to get them on the search. And uh, they have some people that really work on finding out the right keywords to use on their site to attract the Google uh, crawlers or whatever they call them anymore, uh, and to find them. And maybe that's something you should look into it uh, because I think it'll broaden the horizon of the people that will use it beyond us, that small community of numismatists. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we played a little bit around with you know, very small amounts of money on, on social media to try and encourage take up that way. Yeah. Um, but we definitely don't want to spend a lot of money on Google ads. Um, oh, I understand that. Definitely. So. Yeah. Yeah. I would suggest the first thing you should do is look into why you don't have a robots.txt file. Okay, good, good, good point. Because with that, you can tell it what to index and what not to index. Okay. And when to hit you and when not to hit you and all the uh -huh. good stuff. So, yeah. Uh, Len, I had a question about um, archive.org, and, and this is really an informational question I discussed already with um, Andrew Reinhardt and David Hill. Um, where basically um, out of copyright books, um, you know, you could just read and download. Um, relatively recently, um, you are now almost in a JSTOR-like situation where you have to get a login through an institution to download these books, which um, as it's often much easier to download them and read them as a PDF. And um, the ANS is obviously a, a contributor there and our books I think are still open for download. This is the, the copies that are sitting in there that we had put in there. But uh, a lot of the material um, I noticed that is sort of numismatic and vaguely thing. Um, now you have to log into this 
and maybe you have it through the university or something, it does it automatically, but the ANAS doesn't have such a status and therefore it's become actually difficult uh, to download these books. Do you know anything about this? Yeah, I, I know, uh, for example, using Hottie Trust, I have to log in as, uh, you know, like a WashU person uh, to download a lot of the material. Um, I, I'm not really sure why they do it that way. I know on Internet Archive, uh, the most you have to do is uh, get a free account and Maybe it's the Hati Trust alone, but the Hat, and this is particular for our uh, foreign members who often can't read even in Hati Trust. So then they come and say, can you download whatever little text it is? And, uh, but now uh, it, you can't actually get access to a lot of this material, except you can read it. Obviously read access is there, but the download access has been taken away. And this is for, you know, 18th, 19th century material. Often. Yeah, so, so the question would be, uh, how does ANS become a member of uh, Hottie mm. Trust? Um, that would I'm be guessing, a good member benefit. Um, yeah, I'm guessing there's some sponsorship fee you have to pay, but I, I have no idea how much it is. Hello, can anyone hear me? Yeah. Hello? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, this is Al Bordiguro. Thanks uh, so much for this talk. I really appreciate it. Sure. And um, wanted to ask if you um, work with an outfit called R Numis. Uh, they're an online resource that has a number of foreign auction catalogs. It's not complete, but there's a lot of the early Jacques Schulman. There are some Adolf Weil. There's, it, it's organized by country. You go in by country, and uh, there's some interesting material there. And um, I'm not sure, um, I haven't been to the website in a little while, I'm not sure who does it, but it's, it's a pretty good resource for foreign auction catalogs. And it's, I think, R, letter, the letter R, NUMIS, N-U-M-I-S, I think it's .org. Um, pretty good resource, and I'm wondering if, if you're aware of them or collaborate with them, because um, I found it to be useful. Yeah, I haven't heard of them, um, but I'll take a look at it and, and see what they're doing. Okay, uh, I'll probably send you an email about the brand ledgers. You mentioned 32 distinct ledgers. Yes. Um, I've been studying them for years and I built a searchable database, uh, as you may know, on some of the uh, brand material. And um, I'm aware of 28 separate ones. Um, and they're a little difficult to access. You have to go in with secondary ledger to get the chronological ones. There are a couple of duplicates. Then there's something called a primary ledger, which just lists the invoices. And then there's something called the extra ledgers. So it's really, you know, a search strategy becomes really important. Um, and I've detected 28 unique ones and a couple of duplicates. So I'm wondering how you get 32, because if, if I'm missing some that's kind of important to me, uh, I'll probably send you an email and ask about that, because that, that kind of really interests me, the, the number 32. Yeah, the way that worked was um, we did the oversized ones first, and yeah. then uh, sometime later we did some of the smaller ones on site. Um, so yeah, there, there might be something uh, you're not aware of. Um, I believe our homepage um, for the, or our landing page for the brand ledgers has a list of everything and also a reference to the ANS library catalog, which I think has a list of all that material. Um, but uh, send me an email, we'll figure it out. Okay, okay, very good. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. and, um, again, thanks so much for all this work. I mean, it's uh -huh. been a, a boon for those of us. Uh, we're trying to do some um, some research at home. And, uh, the, the brand has kind of consumed me for the last few years. And it's sure. taken a while to build a searchable database. Well, well I'm, I'm really glad to see that uh, material being developed and, yeah. uh, you know, people can look at it in the convenience of their home and uh, dig out all these uh, interesting things for their indexes. Are, are all the Chapman outgoing correspondence, um, I know that stuff is on onion skin. It's really difficult to uh, scan. Uh, last time I checked, there were a couple of years missing. I think 86, 87 was missing. Is it all in there now? Um, so in, in terms of what ANS has, uh, we've done about 80% of it. There are other uh, Chapman correspondence collections that are held privately. 
uh, and okay. we currently don't have access to those. Um, so, but we, we know there's more out there. Yeah, and thanks so much for doing the incoming correspondence because I've gone through those envelopes and boy, is that painful. Uh, I mean, they did it alphabetically, but it sure is painful. And there's a bunch of letters from Virgil Brand, which I found extremely eye-opening. Sure. And I've, uh, I've transcribed those. Um, I'm going to go look for those at, at, the, uh, at the website. Now. Yeah, so, so in addition to the actual scanning, um, we're doing curation work on that as well. So it, it's all going into mm -hmm. archival folders, and it will be really nicely organized um, once it's done. Yeah, hats off to you. Thank Real you. service to numismatics. Thank you. All right, I got uh, one more question here about Carnegie Institute archives. I'm trying to think uh, even where the Carnegie information is that all is that all in Pittsburgh? I'm not even sure what that is. Could be in Pittsburgh. The Carnegie Museum. We we did uh, recently we uh, photographed the large scent collection uh, held by uh, Carnegie Museum. It was the uh, not the front line set, obviously, which is at a &S, but the, the second line uh, clap coins um, are all uh, in Pittsburgh. And those, those have been photographed and are now online on Newman Portal. Um, I wasn't aware they had a lot of other numismatic stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, if there is, um, somebody let me know and we'll look into it. Okay, well, if we don't have any more questions, I just want to let everyone know that the next Money Talks will be on July 18th with Ray Williams called An Introduction to the State Coinages of the Federation, 1785 to 1788. So I will be sending all that information out next week, so you can let me know if you want to come. But one more call for questions for Len. <laughs> all right, well, thank you. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. All right, cool. I hope everyone has a good weekend. Thank you. This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Since 1858, the ANS has supported research and education in numismatics and the history of money. With a collection of over 800,000 objects, an extensive library, a dynamic publishing arm, and ever-improving online research resources, we have become one of the largest numismatic institutions in the world. If you wish to support the ANS and the work we do, you can join as a member and become a part of this historic community. Go to numismatics.org membership to see options and prices.